So, sorry for the delay. Welcome to the Astrobiology Seminar. Uh, we're not having a full series this quarter. We will have one in the spring quarter, uh, but we are going to be having uh, three candidate visits. This is the first of them for the Astrobiology uh, faculty position. And uh, Vicki, if she came here, uh, would be both in Astrobiology and sitting in the Astronomy Department. Um, so uh, we're really working here because she gave a talk to the Astronomy Department just at, at 1230. Um, so we're hoping that her voice will hold out. But Vicki got her PhD in 1994 at Sydney University, uh, where she was a student of David Allen, one of the pioneers of ground-based uh, infrared astronomy. And she came to JPL after that and has been in the States uh, ever since, uh, primarily working on Venus, but other solar system projects too. And we've known her very well in the astrobiology program because she has been one of the uh, uh, leaders of the so-called nodes or research groups that the NASA Astrobiology Institute has sponsored over the years, just as it has here at the UW. And so she's a colleague that we've known for many years, and we're delighted to, to have her here for this uh, visit and for her Um She's going to be talking about what that node is all about, the Virtual Planetary Laboratory, uh, which is a marvelous simulation of what other terrestrial planets might look like to something like the Terrestrial Planet Finder. So take it away, thank you. Okay, so thank you all for coming, and especially those on uh, WebEx uh, virtually as well. Hi. Um, so now, my name is Dr. Vicki Meadows. I was the uh, principal investigator for the Virtual Planetary Lead Team, which we now call an alumni team or a former member of the NASA Astrobiology Institute. And we are 40 people at a total of 18 different institutions. So there's not more than two or three of us at any given institution. And, uh, but nonetheless, we managed to collaborate virtually via email and, and meetings and, and visitor collaborations. So what I'm going to talk to you today about are uh, four major topics. First, I'm going to review so-called habitability markers and biosignatures, what we would look for in the spectrum of a planet around another star to try and understand what its planetary environment is like. I'm then going to talk about work that we've done already on taking Earth, or ripping away the sun, throwing it away, and replacing it with some other type of star, and looking at how the Earth's atmosphere would respond to the different radiation that's coming in, and what that does to the atmosphere and the spectrum of the planet. Then I'm going to also talk about new work that we've done on high, high carbon dioxide early Earths, uh, specifically looking to try and produce oxygen from these atmospheres by doing all sorts of things, adding UV radiation, volcanism, various different things, uh, and I'll show you some of the results from that and what we found. And finally, I'm going to cap off with some very new work that's coming out in March uh, on extrasolar photosynthesis and trying to understand what the preferential pigments for photosynthesis would be like on planets around other stars by looking at the places in the uh, spectrum of radiation on the surface of the planet where a plant would really get the best value for photosynthesis. Um, and uh, first of all, I usually like to talk, uh, finish, I usually like to begin these talks by uh, talking about the fact that the planets that we find, the extrasolar terrestrial planets, even though we've never detected one yet, it's highly probable that they're going to be very different to the three examples of terrestrial planets with atmospheres that we have in our own solar system. So when we talk about you know, learning about what these might be like or how to characterize them, we have to keep in mind that these planets are likely to be very alien, and they may span a range of characteristics that's just not seen in our own uh, planetary system. So to get a handle on what these might be like, we really do have to resort to modeling. We don't yet have the observations. We've got a few examples in our solar system, but it really is modeling that will allow us to push that phase phase out and explore in a virtual way what these planets might be like and what we might expect to see. So the plot that we have up here, Planetary System Diversity, uh, Marco, is, uh, shows some of the results from the Raymond, Quinn, and Lunin modeling of different types of planetary systems, so these are planet formation models. And what they show is a whole series of colored dots here which represent planets, where the color is the volatile abundance, and in particular the water abundance in the planet, where blue is very water rich, and red is very water poor. And the uh, black circles donate the iron fraction in the planet. So 
um, you can see in these plots, the semi-major axis uh, is plotted on the bottom, so that's the distance from its parent star. And then the eccentricity, how much it varies from a circle, uh, is plotted on the y-axis. So in these planetary models, they do make a menagerie of different types of planets with varying abundances of water uh, different to the Earth, uh, Venus, and Mars in our own case. And so we anticipate that when we go out and look with something like the terrestrial planet finder, that we're going to find really strange and wonderful things. And so the virtual planet laboratory, as I said, is trying to explore what those strange and wonderful things might look like. So when we remotely detect our planet around another star, it's going to be unresolved. We're not going to be able to see spatial information on it. We won't be able to see continents or clouds or oceans directly in our astronomical images. It will look like a pixel and uh, hopefully a nice blue pixel, uh, but a pixel is pretty much all we're going to get. So uh, everything we learn about this planet must be obtained from what we call disk average data. So the, the disk of the planet is essentially squished down, no spatial resolution, but we can get spectral resolution. So we have a, a disk averaged uh, observation of the planet, but at different wavelengths. Uh, and from that, we have to dry, try and uh, decompose what the planet is like, whether it has oceans or uh, or uh, clouds or different types of surface features. And my time steps are not working here, so sorry about that. Um, so in essence, not only do we have to understand the environment from the disk average, but whether or not there is life on it must also be determined from this disk average. So the signs of life must be a global phenomenon on this planet, or we really don't have a very good chance of detecting them. So when we talk about the habitability zone, when we look at planets around other stars, we're really talking about what we call the classic habitability zone, which is the range at which liquid water can remain, uh, sort of, sorry, the water can remain liquid on the surface of the planet. And uh, I know that a lot of people here work on Europa and other types of environments that are outside of this classic habitable zone where none Nonetheless, life may be possible, but these would be very difficult to detect remotely, so we don't include them uh, in, in our definition of, of a habitable zone region. So uh, I also want to say that when we try and characterize the planet and learn about it, our ability to do that will only be as good as the effective emitting layer of the planet. So essentially, at the wavelength that we choose, how far we can penetrate into the planet's atmosphere is, is all we're going to get. So if the planet, for example, is completely covered with clouds, as Venus is, and we observe in the visible, then we can only characterize the, the, the atmosphere above the clouds, and that's all we will have. So there will be instances where we might find an extremely interesting planet, but we may not have the capability to actually probe all the way to the surface to find out if it can, in fact, support liquid water. So these are the kind of challenges we have when trying to remotely characterize an entire, entire world. So the things that we will look for when we find our terrestrial planet around another star are, you know, what are the planetary system environmental characteristics? Of course, the parent star like? Is it a nice parent star? Uh, is it fairly stable or is it actively flaring all the time and being difficult? Are there other planets in the solar system that might improve the chances of the planet that we found being habitable? For example, a nice stable Jovian planet in an outer solar system orbit. We'll also look for mass and orbital parameters and with the suite of missions that uh, NASA has planned, the best instrumentation for doing that is something called the Space Interferometry Mission, or SIM. So SIM may be able to get us the mass and orbital parameters for planets that are uh, maybe as, as small as three Earth masses. So we would like to have that mission to at least have already gotten us our mass and orbit before we go after it with Terrestrial Planet Finder to try and get a spectrum. So we will look for terrestrial planets in the so-called habitable zone, this classic habitable zone. But to do that, we really will have to have the orbit to know whether it's circular and the planet stays in the habitable zone, or whether it's uh, eccentric and there may be slight excursions from the habitable zone. Uh, but it's very important to have that orbital information. And terrestrial planet finder, by the way, may not be very good at that. So. Uh, Photometric characteristics is the next thing we will look for because, of course, we're very starved for photons here. So uh, we'll try and look at colors first. We'll look at the brightness and color of the target, so how much radiation is coming in at different wavelengths, uh, and look and see if there's any temporal variability that might hint at inhomogeneity uh, on the, uh, of the planet, you know, whether or not you're seeing continents and clouds and oceans, things moving around. Uh, and then finally, the most powerful tool that we have will be spectra, and these are the most difficult observations to get because we must take already photon poor uh, radi radiation information and then disperse it even further. Um, but nonetheless, if we can get good spectra of these planets, that's our most powerful tool for working out what they're like. 
And in those spectra, we'll look for things like carbon dioxide, which lets me know that I probably have a terrestrial planet with an atmosphere. It's uh, not common to see a lot of carbon dioxide on a Jovian planet with an atmosphere. And in fact, the three planets we have, uh, Venus, Earth, and Mars, all have strong carbon dioxide absorption. So that's considered characteristic of a terrestrial planet. We'll look for water vapor, which may be a good indicator that there's liquid water on the surface. Not always, but it's usually a pretty good indicator that we have it. We'll look for signs that there's an ultraviolet shield somewhere in the atmosphere. So you look for signs that there's something we recognize as a UV shield, like ozone, our famous ozone layer. So we'll either look directly for ozone in the spectrum, or we will look for what we call secondary signs of a UV shield, and that is looking for the temperature effect of ozone in the absorption band of other molecules. So carbon dioxide, for example, has a central peak in it, which denotes our hot stratosphere, and that stratosphere is hot because of ozone. So even if we didn't detect ozone, we would look for that hot central peak that says, hey, there's something up high in the atmosphere absorbing UV radiation, and that's a good thing, because it protects the life underneath, or the potential life. And then, of course, we will do a spectral determination over the longest wavelength range we possibly can to try and get a census of what gases are in the atmosphere and whether they are greenhouse gases and how much of them there are. Because ultimately, being able to measure the surface temperature of the planet, that's the holy grail of, of uh, habitability, can we determine the surface temperature and pressure and know that there's liquid water on the surface? That measurement directly is highly unlikely. What will probably happen is that we will measure some temperature. We won't know exactly where in the atmosphere it is. Uh, but we will then need to know, uh, to have a look at these other gases and their opacities to work out where we might be sampling it, and more importantly, to determine how much greenhouse warming this planet can, can provide to then try and infer the surface temperature from that. So that surface temperature is probably going to be a model-derived de um, parameter. So when we look at biosignatures, they fall into three basic categories. First of all, the biosignatures we're looking at are not like the in situ biosignatures where you pick up a rock and you sample it and try and tell if it has life in it. These are signs of life that are observable by a telescope. So we call them astronomical biosignatures. And so these have to be global scale, photometric, spectral, or temporal features that are indicative of life. That's the three classes. So um, as we can see in this, this upper plot here, um, life can provide global scale modification of a planet's atmosphere. And for our own planet, oxygen uh, is the, the most obvious marker of that. Here's my pointer. Excellent. Um, so up here, uh, we have a very strong band of oxygen, the oxygen A band in the, in the optical. That much oxygen in the atmosphere is considered to be indicative of life. So that's an atmospheric biosignature. Uh, down here, we have a surface biosignature. And this is, in fact, a spectrum taken down through the Earth's atmosphere over a conifer forest. And what it shows is a very characteristic rise in the red at about 0.7 microns. It's called the red edge. It's um, a reflective uh, property of leaves, longwood of 0.7 microns. And so it's characteristic of surface vegetation. And that signature can be seen from space, and it can be seen in the disk average, although it's quite difficult uh, in that case. Then the other thing we look at is, are there any changes in the planet's appearance over time that might be indicative of life cycles? Um, and one of these in our Earth's atmosphere, admittedly very subtle and difficult to detect, but we'd have to try and hope that maybe on another planet it might be more obvious. But in our own Earth's atmosphere, we have the cycling of methane and carbon dioxide in the northern atmosphere due to the production and decay of vegetation uh, in the northern atmosphere, and in fact, life in general. So we see this annual cycling over time for methane and carbon dioxide. But one thing we have to fundamentally remember, as do the people who do in situ biosignatures, is that to recognize a biosignature, you really have to have a good idea of the environment you're studying, because biosignatures must always be identified in the context of their environment. And uh, for example, Earth methane is in an environment that is very rich in oxygen. And oxygen and methane don't particularly like each other. They don't hang around long for a long time together unless there are active sources of them. And in this particular case, those active sources are both uh, life-driven. Uh, and so uh, Earth, methane in the presence of oxygen is a biosignature, but on Titan, methane is just uh, one of the, the main constituents or main trace gases of the atmosphere. Uh, and so in Titan case, we don't think that the methane is actually indicative of life. So what the Virtual Planetary Laboratory does, and what we have done, is that we model planetary environments and their spectra. So we have developed a suite of models um, of planetary environments, uh, including 1D spectral models of planets with known environments. So that was the easiest thing to do. Uh, so we have models of Venus, Earth, and Mars, 
the beauty of a model, even though we've, we've got and observed all these planets, is the model can run from the UV to the fire infrared with no dropouts due to the fact that we haven't got data sources there. So what we do is we can generate the model, uh, calibrate it, validate it against regions of the spectrum we have observed, and then use physics and chemistry to predict what the rest of the spectrum will look like throughout the entire range. We also have 3D spectral models of planets in our own solar system, namely Earth and Mars. So these are models that, uh, where we input the atmospheric parameters of Earth and Mars and generate spectra for uh, all of the positions, for a whole suite of positions on the planet. And so this three-dimensional spectral model can be played around with, and it was specifically designed uh, to try and understand how detectable vegetation might be in the disk average, but it can also be used to analyze things like Earthshine data, which is the disk average radiation that is reflected uh, from the moon of, of the Earth. But we can also do fun things with it. The Mars model, we've covered Mars um, consecutively with ice. We've had the polar ice cap work its way right down the planet and had a look at how the Mars spectrum would evolve with time uh, with that uh, uh, change in the, in the CO2 ice. And interestingly, you can, in fact, see the signature of CO2 ice in the disk average, even for the current ice caps. Um, but when, when the, the ice comes down, you definitely get a much stronger signature for CO2 ice. Um, other things we've done, that are, our main things that we like to work on are our 1D coupled climate chemical models of plausible extrasolar environments. So these are models that are based on models of uh, planets in our own solar system, but that are made sufficiently general uh, that we can, in fact, model other types of environments. And the things I'm going to talk about here are our early Earth-like environments and also Earth-like planets around other stars. So here are models of terrestrial planets in the visible, and we're just going to run through these so that you'll learn and, and uh, be able to recognize some of the major features of the spectra I'm going to talk about uh, in the subsequent rest of the talk. So Venus, Earth, and Mars, um, these two planets, Venus, Venus and Mars, actually are dominated by carbon dioxide absorption, uh, especially from the, the, the near infrared outwards, and it might be difficult to tell, but these are in fact the same features here of carbon dioxide. So that's what you see uh, dominating the spectrum of these two planets. For, uh, for Earth, though, it's extremely uh, different. Uh, and it is dominated by water vapor uh, throughout and then by oxygen, uh, the oxygen A band, which is, which is there. And the other thing that you can see on these planets is that in a relatively cloud-free Earth, you do have a turn up to the blueward end of the spectrum of Earth uh, that is due to Rayleigh scattering from molecules in our atmosphere. And in the case of Venus, even though uh, this is often used as an indicator of atmospheric pressure, by the way, but for Venus, even though its atmospheric pressure is higher overall, again, we're only sampling the atmosphere above the cloud deck, uh, which is much, much, uh, has much less mass and atmosphere, and I think it's close to 30 millibars or something like that. And so you really don't see as much of an upward turn here. Plus, Venus also has this thing called the unknown UV absorber, which is a UV absorber, which we don't know what it is, hence it's called the unknown UV absorber. And the unknown UV absorber does, in fact, tend to absorb uh, that bluer end away, so it masks any Rayleigh scattering you are seeing. On Mars, the situation is even worse, in, in a sense. Uh, Mars has strong absorption from iron oxides on the surface of the planet, and its weak Rayleigh scattering atmosphere is no match for, for that absorption feature. So on Mars, you actually have what looks like a negative Rayleigh effect, but that's, of course, not possible. And uh, what you're seeing is, in fact, iron oxide absorption on the surface. So if we go to the mid-infrared, so this is just a different wavelength regime, same planets, um, you can see this thing I was talking about, the carbon dioxide feature, which is extremely strong on all of them. And uh, that's kind of going to be the easiest thing for a telescope to detect, not that any of this is easy, but a relatively easy thing for them to detect uh, is this, this broad carbon dioxide band to say, yes, I have a planet with an atmosphere, it's probably terrestrial. So that's one of the things we'll look for. You also have water vapor in all of these atmospheres, though in Venus and Mars, very small amounts. And you can see that the, the H2O water vapor continuum down here is, is far more depressed uh, than these other two. Um, but what you also see is that, the again, the Earth spectrum is the most complicated of all of them. And in this regime, this wavelength regime down here, was sensitive to a number of different metabolites. So things, out, things that life outputs, like nitrous oxide and methane, uh, and ozone, which is used as a proxy for oxygen. So you can see the strong ozone band uh, here. And actually, this is the wavelength regime here, where Mars CO2 ice absorbs, and that's where we would look for, say, a planet that had maybe undergone atmospheric collapse and frozen its atmosphere out on the surface. You might look for that phenomenon there. So 
I've been showing all these lovely spectra at zero noise and, uh, you know, lovely spectral resolution. But in actual fact, when we look for planets around other stars, we will be photon starved, as I said. And so the, uh, the resolution of our, our spectrographs is not going to be very high simply because we need to bin as many photons as possible uh, into the individual bins to get enough signal to noise to be able to detect a feature. So what I've plotted here, this is still zero noise, um, but it shows the type of spectral resolution we might expect with an instrument called TPFC, uh, which is going to be a large telescope that is sensitive to light in the optical type CCD type uh, uh, sensitivities. And from there, you can see that even for Venus, um, several of these features, including the strong CO2 bands, uh, become a little bit washed out, but still that's the 1.05 uh, micron CO2 band, that's still probably going to be detectable at reasonable signal to noise. There's the Earth's oxygen band. But one thing I like to show in this plot is that it's very important to have a wide wavelength range when you're trying to characterize these things because at this wavelength, 0.725, depending on your planet, the dip you see is either carbon dioxide, water vapor, or methane at these resolutions. Okay, so it's very important to have more wavelength range around this area, and this would be the area we would choose to try and get the, the oxygen band. You really need more wavelength around that area to, to capture you know, uh, second and third absorptions of the same species to confirm the detection of the thing you think you're seeing. Okay, so now we'll move on to some of the, the VPL modeling uh, that we've been doing. This is work that's been led by um, our postdoc Antigona Segura, who has just recently left us for a uh, university job at UNAM. She said it's her dream job, so we're very happy for her there. And uh, I just listed the names of the VPL people who were intimately involved in, in doing this work and just showed their expertise to show you that this is a truly interdisciplinary effort. Uh, we have, you know, stellar radiation experts, uh, dealing with biology experts, and then the climate, chemistry, and planetary modelers as well. So what we've done here is taken uh, 1D photochemical models and radiative convective models and had them coupled together so that they interact with each other to produce self-consistent environments. And what I mean by that is that when the radiation from the star comes into the atmosphere and heats it up uh, due to absorption from species in the atmosphere, we run the models so that that heating then affects the chemistry and the resulting chemistry then affects the heating. So the whole thing is coupled till it becomes a self-consistent state. So I haven't just you know, thrown oxygen up into the, ozone up into the atmosphere and expected that, that nothing would change in the temperature structure because I know ozone will absorb UV and it will heat it up. So that's the self-consistent climate chemical modeling that we do. Once we've actually gotten an environmental state using this, we run it through the smart radiative transfer model. And uh, that then helps us to generate these uh, synthetic spectra of what the environment would look like. So we can see what a telescope would see if it was looking at this particular environment. So um, the first step in doing this modeling, because it's Earth around other stars, is to make sure we have really good input stellar spectra. And so instead of approximating these as a black body, which would cause Martin Cohen, our collaborator, to collapse with a heart attack, uh, we have used realistic uh, stellar spectra with, from real stars with names um, and gathered as much data as we possibly can. And Martin has worked uh, with us to, to sew all of this together along with next-gen models and a bunch of other things to, to get the best possible full wavelength range spectrum of the star we possibly can. And in this particular case, having accurate representation of the UV is really important because the UV is what drives the photochemistry. And I know we choose TPF target stars based on their, their optical classifications, uh, but it turns out that the UV is actually going to be you know, the main indicator of what you're going to see and what the planet is going to be like. And that may not be the same even for something of the same spectral class determined in the visible. So the stars we used for this were the sun, an obvious one to start with. Uh, we used an F2 star, K2 star, K2 dwarfs, and then we used AD Leo, which is probably one of the most active M stars known, so that was an extreme end of it. And then we also used a model of a similar spectral type, but that had no activity. It actually doesn't have a chromosphere. And yes, I know this is completely unrealistic. However, it serves as a, as a lower bound on the type of UV activity we're going to see from these stars. And so there are the stellar spectra we used and their UV activity. And it's interesting, too, that the more active stars, um, like uh, AD Leo, for example, you actually do get a lot of UV that, that's almost comparable uh, with the sun at the shorter wavelengths. 
So one thing we looked at as far as habitability is concerned is, is we put these planets around stars of different spectral type and uh, you know, ran their, their temperature structures and looked at how, for example, things like the ozone would adjust within the atmosphere. And so these different colors, even though they're labeled by star name, are actually the planets around that star. And each planet was put around its star in the habitable zone. So we gave it that much of a chance. And uh, what you're seeing here is the formation of an extremely hot stratosphere in the F star. Because okay, this is Earth, remember, it has oxygen in it. So we, we created ozone, very, very strong ozone layers in this particular case. In the M star case, we didn't um, create as much of an ozone layer, so you don't see as much stratospheric heating there. But what we also did was then look at um, how much of the UV radiation actually came through the planetary atmosphere and hit the surface of the planet, and what that would do in the way of DNA damage for these, these various types of planets. So it turns out that the interaction of the UV radiation from the star with the oxygen in our atmosphere produced ozone layers that just seem to almost follow a Goldilocks principle in the sense that um, even for the F star, with, the, with a lot of UV radiation, it formed a super ozone layer and was able to block most of the dangerous UV radiation from hitting the surface of the planet. So the actual uh, percentage DNA damage, or relative DNA damage, uh, relative to the Earth was in fact less, slightly less in this particular case. And also for the K star, even though it didn't produce as, as a thick an ozone layer as the Earth, it still managed to shield the surface of the planet pretty well. So uh, we discovered that you know, Earth is actually pretty robust to changes in the UV uh, flux and, and spectrum of the parent star. So there's, there's reason to hope that if oxygenic photosynthesis develops and you do have the oxygen, no matter what spectral type your, your star is, you can still have an ozone shield. So we, we then calculated, we then cut the ozone by factors of 10 and calculated at which point we really wouldn't want to go out and go sunbathing. And we discovered that the critical threshold for oxygen to provide a UV planetary shield is probably about 1% of the current level we have in our atmosphere. So even at 1% of the current level, it's still moderately reasonable on the surface of the planet for UV flux. We also looked at what happened to other biosignatures in the atmosphere when the planet went around a star of a different spectral type. So uh, we looked at three uh, major biomarkers, two you've probably heard of, methane and nitrous oxide, but the new one was methyl chloride, which is in fact uh, produced by um, biomass burning on our planet. It also comes from the oceans, and I think it's supposed to be part of, of algae or perhaps uh, producing it. But it's something that was in the climate chemical model which we hadn't taken out to model spectrally before, and we just decided, well, what the heck? You know, even though it's not that detectable in the Earth's atmosphere, who knows how detectable it might be on a planet or on another star? And so what we did, what we're showing here, is in fact the mixing ratio of these different gases, how much of these different gases are in the atmospheres of these planets, and how they drop off with altitude. Um, and this drop off, of course, is probably due to UV uh, photolysis and or chemical removal in the case of methane uh, in the upper atmosphere. But what you see here is, is, a, is a very big dichotomy uh, between you know, the abundance of methane on stars around FGK, on planets around FGK, and then how much you get in the uh, atmospheres of M star planets. And in all cases, these biomarkers tended to build up in the atmospheres of M star planets because they had much longer lifetimes there. So if you look at the lifetimes, there's certainly a transition when you go from the FGK through to um, the M stars, dramatic increases in the lifetimes of some things. But interestingly, the methane and the methyl chloride are actually scrubbed out uh, by OH production and then O siglet D, uh, which requires certain UV radiation um, to initiate that reaction. And so um, they, in fact, have longer lifetimes relative to something like nitrous oxide, which is just simply photolyzed in the atmosphere. So we found that, in fact, nitrous oxide didn't build up and, you know, quite as rapidly as we would have liked, a factor of two between here and here, instead of you know, a factor of uh, 1,000 for the, for the methyl chloride and methane buildup. So certainly for M star planets around, uh, yeah, planets around M stars, you, you would tend to get, we believe, a buildup of these methylated compounds in the atmosphere. So what we did then was model what the spectra of these planets would look like. And the black line here is Earth, just for reference. And uh, the red line is the planet around AD Leo. So this is the active flaring M star. And uh, this is what we saw in the final um, atmosphere. What we saw was, was greatly enhanced methane absorption, which as I've just described, you might expect, because the methane lifetime went up. Um, and we see, because again, we're around an M star, we don't have too much ozone, 
uh, in the upper atmosphere being produced. So you're not seeing a hot stratosphere here like you would on the Earth. So that's also a bit of a, a giveaway. Um, but we also saw nitrous oxide detection here. And in fact, this is methyl chloride here and here and a little bit over here. Uh, but we were able to see that in the spectrum. And actually, methyl chloride is very interesting. When I first plotted its absorption spectrum, uh, it actually has a very strong absorption right here in the ozone as well, the same wavelength. So uh, it actually mimics a lot of our biosignatures in one molecule. Um, so it can be hard to pull out uh, from, from the others. Uh, so what we also looked at is, of course, the FGK planetary spectra and how they changed. Um, Essentially, what we were seeing here was, again, the change in the strength of the ozone layer and the heating of the stratosphere was, was present in the carbon dioxide. And again, you saw that in the, uh, the ozone itself, the direct measure. Over in the visible, the only thing that really changed in the spectrum was the ozone Chapuy bands uh, between uh, 0.5 and 0.7. They changed in strength, again, depending on the ozone level in the atmosphere. Um, and here's just a blow-up of that showing exactly what was going on. This was very intriguing. Um, it turned out that the, the ozone absorption uh, for the G and K stars was almost the same level of detectability, even though the K star had far less ozone in its atmosphere. And this was because, because it had far less ozone, its stratosphere wasn't as hot. And so the cooler stratosphere relative to the surface of the planet meant that we got more absorption, more bang for the buck in absorption for a smaller amount of material because of that temperature difference. Conversely, for the F star, we had loads of ozone in the atmosphere, but that heated up the stratosphere, and so we didn't get as much of a temperature differential with the surface, and so that absorption was, in fact, less. So, so the point I want to make here is, in, in, in the infrared, as many of you know, the strength of your absorption feature and how detectable it would be to a telescope depends not only on the amount of material that you have, but on the temperature structure that material is embedded in. And that's really important when we're trying to uh, pull out the characteristics of these planets. And then in the methane, we saw predictably on the later type star, the K star, not as much methane destruction and so a stronger methane feature. So here, and this is a bit much to get into, but I'll try and point out the salient points. Um, th this was uh, what happened when we took the oxygen uh, in the atmosphere from present atmospheric level, which is what we currently have on the Earth, and brought it down by factors of 10 successively. We then looked at the detectability of oxygen and ozone when we did that on the planet. So for planets around F, G, and K stars with different oxygen abundances in their atmospheres, uh, what we saw again was the G and K stars looked pretty similar. The F star for the ozone was pathological because of this really super hot stratosphere. And so what we found there was, in fact, if you had the current level of oxygen in our atmosphere, the ozone was less detectable than if you had only 1% of the current oxygen in our atmosphere. That was actually the sweet spot. At 1% of the current level of oxygen and the UV of the F star, that was the point at which we got the strongest detection of, of ozone, the strongest feature. And for oxygen, they look identical right across the board. So the spectrum of the parent star didn't really change our ability to detect the oxygen at all. And uh, essentially, we were, we were sensitive down to about one part in 10 to the minus 3 here for these types, being able to detect something below that, really very difficult to detect. But down here, probably only one part in uh, 10 to the minus 2, 1% of the current oxygen level is, is going to be something we battle for. And even that, it would be quite hard to detect. So for the active M star planets, uh, we also looked at the difference in the spectrum between Earth. Uh, which is the black line, and AB Rio, which is the, the red line here. This is the active M star. The main difference we saw was in the methane, the methane buildup in the atmosphere uh, around the M star. Um, and there, for some reason, I had this methyl chloride slide out of sequence. I apologize for that. So again, the one you've already just seen of the features uh, in the, uh, the mid-infrared with that methyl chloride in here. And if the ozone were not there, we would see a very strong feature from methyl chloride right there. Uh, and so here is a plot showing you where methyl chloride absorbs. What I've done is we, we modeled AD Leo without the methyl chloride, so that's what its spectrum would have looked like, the blue one. And then we uh, modeled it uh, with the methyl chloride, that's the red one. And you can see the regions in which it, it absorbs through here. So that's a potential new biomarker to look for, which had not previously been considered. And then finally, again, back to reality. These are the type of resolutions we might expect from the first generation of TPFI, which is the interferometer in the mid-infrared. So a resolution about 20 across that wavelength range I've just been showing you. Um, nonetheless, it's tough, but nonetheless, we still might be able to pick up the ozone, even if in one pixel here. 
Um, and we can also look, if we get good enough signal to noise, to look for that central peak that would indicate an ozone uh, or a UV absorber of some kind in the CO2 band. So it's going to be tough, but you know, those things may well be observable uh, if we, if we uh, integrate for long enough. So moving on to this phase, high CO2, early Earth-like planets. And how am I going for time, Woody or Tom? <coughs> I mean, we start late, so 15 more minutes. 15 more minutes, okay. So uh, what we did here was, in fact, uh, model uh, high CO2 early Earths up to three bars uh, atmospheres um, using a solar analog spectrum. EK Draw is a G star like the sun, but in a very early stage of its evolution. It has a lot of UV. So what we were trying to do was test the hypothesis that you could, in fact, from a CO2-rich atmosphere, produce a lot of oxygen. Uh, within the habitable zone, and that this would be a false positive for life. It would be a way of producing lots of oxygen that had nothing to do with life. Um, however, Jim Casting noticed that when this hypothesis first came out, that the model was used didn't actually include rain out of oxidized species, which would affect the, the hydrogen and budget within the uh, planet environment. So we went back and we modified our climate model, or in fact, I think he already had it in there, to include the rain out of the oxidized species, and we ran these experiments again. Um, and so we modeled planets with varying amounts of um, O2, uh, varying amounts of CO2 in their atmosphere. And uh, also early Earth-like methane fluxes and uh, around this, this early star. So unfortunately, this is the slide. I don't think time steps, yeah. So there would have been a spectrum under here I would have shown you. Um, but I'll just talk a little bit about this mid-infrared one here. Uh, what we saw was that, predictably, uh, for the higher CO2 fraction planets, we saw very strong absorption from CO2 in the mid-infrared that you wouldn't normally see, for example, in present-day Earth. And uh, these, these are from hot bands and isotopic bands. And that was also very interesting. These were very strong signals from isotopic bands of CO2 uh, where the oxygen was actually changing its, its, its isotope um, value. And so potentially, this is a way of even getting a handle on oxygen isotope ratios in the, in the atmosphere of the stars. So the bottom line of all of this is we, we, we threw everything we could at this planet. We gave it every single possible chance to create oxygen for us. Uh, we switched off volcanism. We, um, we gave it a very high UV star. We, we put lo loads of CO2 in there. But with that rain out of oxidized species in there, there was no way we could actually generate a reasonable amount of O2 from this model. So here's the oxygen A band for present Earth. And here's the oxygen A band for every single thing we modeled. So you can see that we really couldn't generate any detectable signature whatsoever. <coughs> There's sort of a kind of a little kick in here in the two bar case, but nothing, nothing significant. So we could never generate anything more than one part in 10 to the 5 of oxygen and the column depth, or one part in 10 to the 4 in the ozone. So the conclusion, the overall conclusion, is that for planets in the habitable zone with an active hydrological cycle, it's probably unlikely we will build up this kind of abiotic oxygen. And so here's sort of like the spectrum that got included that I couldn't show you. This is, this is the results for planets with different amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere. And you notice the, uh, the actual huge increase in, in Rayleigh scattering for our two-bar planet. Even that's two bars of CO2, it's actually a totally three-bar planet because it has almost a bar of nitrogen in it as well. And uh, so this was, this was our sort of exotic three-bar planet. And uh, we see this, this very high Rayleigh scattering. You note that at 0.76, you do not see the oxygen A band here, so we don't see that. But what we do see is lots of signatures from carbon dioxide as we go into the near-infrared end of the spectrum. And in particular, this one here, which I fought to get on TPF for a long time, are the 1.05 micron CO2 band, which we also saw in Venus even at low resolution. Um, that would be a nice <coughs> indicator uh, if you were to see, even if you were to see a false positive of oxygen. This is fairly strong for high CO2 atmospheres. So you might be able to pick that out and know that you were being, being fooled. But, uh, but these regions here, very strong in methane and carbon dioxide, and uh, almost to the point where you don't even have an atmospheric window over large fractions of this range of the, of the spectrum. So that was that. Um, and then... <laughs> This is the planet in the mid-infrared, red is the Earth, which you should recognize by now. And then the black spectrum is the spectrum of this, this three-bar, two-bar CO2 atmosphere. And uh, again, we're seeing the strong bands of isotopes of, of carbon dioxide in it. 
And in here, this is the only atmospheric window we have left where we can get deep into the atmosphere and try to determine the temperature of the planet. So on, on the Earth, we consider the atmospheric window to be right across here from 8 to 13 microns, but on a CO2 planet, it's narrowed to a tiny, tiny little range around about uh, uh, 9 microns. But you note that for Venus, even though it has very similar features, because Venus is also a high CO2 atmosphere, uh, the depth of these features is nowhere near as strong. And that's, again, because we're truncated by the cloud deck on Venus. I can't get down to see the full 93 bars of atmosphere there. So brightness temperatures um, for these. Uh, again, this was interesting because this planet had about a 317 Kelvin surface temperature. But you'll note that the inferred brightness temperature is only about 288. So we really are not seeing to the surface of the planet because the CO2 atmosphere is so dense. So this is kind of one of these warnings I like to put out that just because you have an atmospheric window doesn't mean you got all the way to the surface in, in sensing the atmosphere. So I will skip through these because it's just a summary of what we've, we've said overall. And uh, move on to the final phase, which, which is the coevolution of photosynthesis with the atmospheres on extrasolar worlds. And this is work that's been led by Nancy Keang um, for the VPL, and it's actually involved a lot of our our younger scientists here, so this is, this is really great, um, great work. And uh, what we're doing here is that before we were, we were modeling planets so that we could look at them from above uh, as an astronomer and, and trying to determine what the planet was like. Here we're looking at them from the vegetation, uh, the leaf side view. Uh, we're looking up at, our, at our, our star of a different spectral type, and we're looking at how much of that radiation makes it through atmospheres of different compositions. So if you take a planet and you put it around another star, what does the leaf see? What does the microbe see at the surface of the planet? And what does that tell you about where it's likely to choose to put its pigments for photosynthesis? So we use planetary atmospheric compositions and uh, stellar spectra for Earth-like planets, so those with the, the one time the, the present atmospheric level of oxygen, and also for near anoxic planets that only had one part in 10 to the 5 of the current level of oxygen in their atmospheres. And we put them around FGK and M stars. So these are the spectra I've just shown you which we use for a different purpose. When we run the radiative transfer model, we generate the spectrum at the top and the spectrum at the surface. So we just took that second product, and that's what we used. So we derived uh, the incident spectral photon flux densities. That's important. Not the radiance, but the actual number of photons that are coming in, because that's what plants care about. Photosynthesis is a photon numerical process. And uh, so that's what we, we had a look at. And we did that for planetary surfaces and underwater as well. We identified photosynthetically relevant radiation and looked at the likely peak, peak absorbance and also made an attempt to calculate planetary productivity. And that is going to be published in the M-STAR special edition of Astrobiology, which is coming out in March. And that should be a, a really great edition, by the way. It's got lots of really good papers in it. So here, um, this is when we have a look at the, this is the spectrum uh, that's incident at the top of our atmosphere from the sun. This is the average spectrum that in fact makes its way through the atmosphere. And what we noticed is that in fact ozone tends to absorb out here and will shift the actual peak of the radiation from what is peak at incident at the top of the atmosphere to what is peak at the surface of the atmosphere actually shifts towards the red. And uh, so what Nancy did was, was put together a series of rules, Nancy and collaborators, uh, of where we might expect pigments for photosynthesis to occur. And the first uh, characteristic you look for is the wavelength of peak incident photon flux at the surface. Okay, so, so again, we found that the atmosphere actually modified that and tended to shift it. Uh, we also say that you should look for the longest wavelength within the radiation window, uh, also for these uh, core antennae or, or, or pigments that are um, satellite pigments that are used. And these, uh, the longest wavelength is so that you can capture the, the photon fairly easily. The shortest wavelength is, is there because it's high energy and therefore valuable. Uh, when you cascade it down to the photon center. So there's the peak, because there's lots of stuff there. And then you also have accessory pigments on either side, satellites, essentially, that also funnel uh, photons into this process to help uh, actually do photosynthesis. So what we found then was that since the ozone Chapuis band strongly affected the peak surface radiation and shifted it over this way, um, that's actually pretty much where chlorophyll A uh, operates, uh, at least on the red end. And, uh, Nancy and collaborators have postulated that that may, in fact, be why plants are green. They're smart. They actually know where the peak photon flux is, and they've gone over there to do their photosynthesis towards the red. Um, what we also looked at was surface incident flux versus the atmospheric composition to see how it changed. Again, ozone was affecting um, the spectrum, what was reaching the surface. So here we kind of have the average uh, incident and then the average on the surface. 
And, it, and again, there's, there's a chunky amount of here in the F-star spectrum from the ozone, very strong ozone absorption. And what that did was actually shift the peak photon flux to the blue for the F-star. So depending on where the ozone fell relative to the stellar spectrum radiation, it would actually shift it either to the blue or over to the red. So in the F-star case, it shifted it to the blue. For pretty much every other planet, it shifted it more towards the red. And in the case of the M-star planets, they had so much absorption from species in their atmospheres, including water and methane, that there were some very quantized windows available for the pigments to work in and uh, other areas where almost no radiation got to the surface. So this is a little bit scary, but what it's showing overall is uh, the peak surface photon flux for Earths around stars of different spectral type. And here we see the peak photon flux for the F-star, push over here to the blue, but for everything else, the peak photon flux is either in the uh, red or, in fact, even moved over into the infrared for some of the M-star planets. Uh, the other thing we looked at is um, what you would see if you were an organism underwater on one of these planets. And the main conclusion is that you probably don't want to be operating, uh, doing your photon catching anywhere longer of 1.1 micron in these particular cases. But it also gave us an idea of where the pigments might be, and especially the M-star planets if we could potentially push them over to infrared radiation, uh, infrared regions, then that would be uh, particularly valuable. Can you, can yeah. you look at different water depths at all, or did you just stay at the, I think that's five centimeters water depth? No, we did, we did also look at different water depths. I don't have the plots, but they're in the, they're in the paper. Yeah, so we, we went down. And um, in fact, I'll show you um, safety levels in a minute. Okay, for the different ones. Um, and oh, here we go. So <laughs> here's the water depths for flare safety. Um, and what we did here was for, for the M-star planets, uh, they're around a star that's potentially active and flaring. So the question is, is it possible to evolve and find a level within water where you're safe from flaring, even the worst of the flaring, but still have enough photons to be able to do photosynthesis? And uh, what we found was that essentially as long as the flares don't exceed this energy here, um, which is I think kind of mid-range, this is the extreme for AD Leo, I believe the extreme that's been seen. Uh, but as long as you don't exceed this range of flare, then you can survive okay on the surface of an M-star planet, even in the habitable zone. You don't need water to protect you. Beyond this energy, you do need water, and this is the depth of water that you need. So the bottom line was that as long as you were 9.1 meters underwater, and I'm sure that point one is really important, but if you were 9.1 meters underwater, um, you would still escape the worst of the flare energy uh, from an M-star and still have enough photons, uh, in fact, to support something like red algae by more than a factor of 10. So that was really interesting, that you could actually find a safe zone but still be able to, to make your food. And so that's the end of the talk here, and these are our major conclusions. Um, planetary environmental modeling has shown us that you know, different planetary compositions and environmental characteristics can be determined from discovery spectra. Larger wavelength coverage is always uh, uh, useful. <laughs> and of course, we as scientists are always pushing the engineers to give us more in the way of instrument uh, capability but certainly a very important for, for census of greenhouse gases, finding metabolites, and being able to, to be certain that what you've seen at low resolution is what you think it is. Um, also, the planet's UV environment affected what we saw in very non-intuitive ways, um, but also the fact that Earth-like planets, as long as you had oxygen, ozone layers would form in response to the spectrum of the parent star in such a way that we retained habitability on the surface. Um, also, the fact that planets around M stars can potentially build up these other gases that are biomarkers because they have longer lifetimes in those atmospheres. Abiotic formation of O2 and O3 in high CO2 atmospheres is unlikely as long as you have an active hydrological cycle. And uh, finally, the, the surface photon flux that you see is, is planetary environment dependent. It depends on what's actually in your atmosphere. Strong dependence on ozone being there as well. And it will likely govern the most advantageous pigments for photosynthesis for planets around stars of different spectral type. So I will leave it there. Well, thank you very much for that wide ranging and fascinating talk. I'm sure there are questions here. Yes. You mentioned getting as much range as you can expectedly, but to be able to potentially narrowband dosmometry or even custom band that put on a lot of different features and what kind of um, what you can determine about the atmosphere is that way. Sorry, I didn't hear the last. 
<laughs> so what was the very last? I, I was saying it seems like maybe you would do better signals. I, mean, I don't yeah. know how that's going to be. You, <laughs> you would. And, and um, there are people who have done that work. Um, uh, West Traub is one of them. And in the Demaray et al. paper, which is a classic biosignature one, they talk about matched filter bands for these types of things. I have a different view. I actually don't like that. And, and here's why. Um, because TPF is going to be an instrument of discovery. And as I said, these planets may be completely unlike anything we've ever seen. So I think it's a little bit dangerous to have nothing but matched filter bands for things we expect to see. Um, one thing I didn't show you here as well is that, that even though you might know roughly how wide the feature is going to be to match the band, you probably never know how wide the continuum is going to be. Um, and, and so the more species you have in, in, the, in the atmosphere and in the spectrum, the more your continuum tends to narrow down. And in some cases, that may be the narrowest feature in the spectrum, those CO2 planets. You know, the continuum is really tiny. Um, so I'm more of the philosophy that, that this thing really should be a broad wavelength capability. And if, if binning is required, which I agree is definitely the better way to go for signal to noise, uh, it would be better if we had a wider wavelength capability that could be binned um, to get signal to noise. But should we be deliriously lucky to get a bright terrestrial planet nearby that we at least have the spectral capability to then go after that one target with as much spectral range as possible. So that's the way I'd rather go, is, is to see some kind of after instrument binning of the data. But again, that requires that we have really low read noise. And I'm not sure those detectors are built yet, but I'm sure we have a lot of time to develop things. So uh, <laughs> hopefully we'll work on that. Other questions? Yes. Kind of a related question. How much of an issue is redshift for the spectrum planets? Uh, negligible, as far as I know. It's it's not a big deal at all. They're, they're really nearby. Tiny compared to what yeah. You're seeing there. I mean, the, the the most distant things are going to be at you know about 10, 15 parsecs. You know, maybe out to 45 at the very outer limit. But we really are extremely close in the solar neighborhood for for trying to find these sorts of things. And the relative motion doesn't matter. No, no, it doesn't. Other questions? Yes. For example, where you said the DNA dangers is a function of spectral type, mm -hmm. I didn't see entries for the M more. Um, no, and I'm not sure. I'd have to talk to Andy. I think we may have calculated those, but we didn't publish them, so I didn't, I didn't take them out of the uh, But if you want them, I, I, we can get them. Do okay. you remember? Uh, I think it's pretty negligible uh, overall, um, even at the surface. And even if we don't produce very much ozone, I, I think it really wasn't a major concern. Some of the higher energy um, A, UVA, can get through. Um, but, but for the rest of it, I think it was down by like a factor of 20 or something versus Earth for the rest of the spectrum. I believe that was that's roughly right. Mark. Follow up on that. With those DNA damages, what age of star? I mean, that, that would change certainly for Earth if you were yeah. looking at an early G star. Certainly the early S star has yeah. huge UV influences. How did you the, the, the F star was probably older. And I mean, we, we plotted the UV that we had for those. Uh, the uh, the uh, M, well, the AD Leo one was actually, you know, outrageously active. I didn't, I didn't show that one. The K star, I can't remember what age it was. But that's certainly true that, you know, very early on, you would have the higher UV fluxes in the activity. So, so the UV fluxes we calculated were for the age of the stars that we chose. And I can't remember exactly what they were, but I think they were ordered billions of years. Have you looked into absorption spectra that we might hope to get as we have with HST um, for transiting planets? Um, I haven't looked into that, but uh, Giovanna Tinetti, who is one of our former postdocs and now is working at EFA in Paris, she's specifically using these types of models to look at transmission spectra uh, through uh, terrestrial planet atmospheres for these types of transits um, as well, and also for Jovians. So yeah, she's working on that. We are not. What do you suggested to me that, that these spectral searches should include uh, designer molecules of advanced life, like Freon, mm -hmm. System 6, et cetera? Um, yeah. Um, OK. <laughs> I have an interesting response to that. He's already wrote about that up. Um, yes, that's conceivable. Uh, some of these have very narrow features and can be only really seen at, at relatively high resolution. So some of them are difficult to detect. Others are so diffuse, they're also difficult to detect on low signal to noise. Um, my, my maybe flip, but, but this is the way I feel, answer is, first of all, do we really want to find these things? And secondly, um, I think that astronomically speaking, unless civilization is really dumb and kills itself, 
those signatures should only be around for a very small period of time until the civilization realizes what the heck it's doing and then scrubs them out of the atmosphere. And I, I think in the case of the Earth, we would have seen these build up and then we will see them go down on a very short span compared with the age of the star. And so astronomically, when we go and look out for TPF, uh, you know, around other stars, I, I don't think there's a very high statistical probability that we'll see it unless they really do destroy their, their well, planet. I would argue that's being the equivalent of your narrow spectral. So you, you don't want to define too much on, on, on Earth. Yeah, basis. but that's the other thing. If we had fil mesh filter bands, you'd never see those. So again, it'd be nice to have the full wave of range. Uh, what sort of uh, sulfur gases can you measure? Um, how do they Right, we do have sulfur dioxide and oxygen carbonyl sulfide that can be measured in those particular wavelength ranges. They are in the same regime, though, as water and methane. So uh, if, if water and methane are present, and if you want a habitable planet, water will be, that does make it quite difficult to pull out. Um, so, so they are there. They're, they're, theoretically, we could observe them but it may be difficult on actual habitable planets, ironically. On, on uninhabited planets, they stick out like a sore thumb. On, on Venus, you know, they're much, much easier to detect uh, overall. But certainly something we could look for, and I know Carl has also been looking at dimethyl sulfide, for example, as an output, and it has a fairly strong feature also in that range. One of the reasons I'm actually asking, too, is that let's assume that we have a, a completely anaerobic habitable planet. Uh-huh. I assume you're going to see a lot of methane, right? At, at that. So there'll be methane and water, which would actually serve to mask a lot of that. But we could certainly try modeling it and see if there's anything there that, that makes its way out. I'm trying to think if there's anything up in that window region. Would be, I think, extremely elevated. Okay. And well, you see what? You build a biomass and you have organisms yeah. utilizing that biomass in the absence of oxygen. Mm -hmm. About 50% of that carbon. Right. Well, you saw what happened when we had a dense CO2 atmosphere. I mean, pretty much most of that region of the mid infrared was eaten away by CO2 absorption. Um, but, I mean, I, I think I can't answer that without doing a model to see if something could slip between the gaps between CO2 and methane that might be detectable, like SO2 or. Uh, the other thing, too, is the arguments that Jim Casting also has, has pointed this out, is that the sulfur gases tend to be very soluble in water. And so if you had an ocean, you might end up scrubbing them out of the atmosphere pretty fast. But as in the case of oxygen, sinks can be overwhelmed. And so you, know, you might argue that potentially you could build up sulfur dioxide. The other thing is discriminating that from volcanism at that time, because the volcanism can also put a lot of sulfur gases into the atmosphere. The other thing is lifetime of sulfur gases in the atmosphere can be fairly short against photolysis. So it depends on what haze we have available. So uh, it's a toughie, but I mean, we could we could try modeling it just to see if anything slips between the cracks. Yeah. <laughs> that we can get. <laughs> so we have a question from outside Seattle. Are uh, are there any questions from Ames or any of the? Um, we don't have any questions here. Okay. So we have time for one or two more here? Yes. Uh, well, I, I was, I'm interested in seeing how your human spectra compared to observed spectra of the Earth. Did, I, I do show some observed spectra and, and lots of do spectra. But, um, right. Well, we have all, all of the Earth spectra that I showed have been validated against um, disk average observations from the TESS instrument as it was going to Mars. It looked back and took uh, spectra, and then in the optical, we have validated against Earthshine spectra. Though, Please pardon the interruption. Your conference contains less than three participants at this time. If you would like to continue, press star one now, or the conference will be terminated. do match the observed spectra for Earthshine and for spacecraft observations of disk average data coming back. So that's the first thing we do before we do anything else. And you didn't have any difficulties in matching any particular Yeah, you do have to get the right cloud balance, which is very variable on the day. And so what we try to do is go and get the MODIS data for the cloud on the day so that we have you know, at least some good approximation of what's going on. Uh, and that's, that's what we try to use. But certainly, if you were doing it just cold, not knowing what the cloud uh, distribution and type was on the day, then you would have to tweak uh, cloud uh, types and abundances to try and get a match to the disk average spectrum. But that, that's the main variable is the cloud. Last question, anyone? 
So, well, thank you again under very difficult circumstances. Thank you.